Hi, good morning, everybody. We're trying a new uh, way of, um, of producing this episode. Uh, I've got uh, McKissick's communications manager um, and technology whiz, Amanda Ballou, behind the scenes working with the Be Live program so that we can share the images that um, that some of you shared with us uh, since the last quilt documentation day. And um, so we'll be uh, doing things a little differently, but hopefully, um, you know, uh, we'll all get to see what I've planned for you all to see and what um, both uh, Lisa Lamfer and Nancy Watkins have shared with us uh, today. Um, Hard for me to tell whether any folks are with us yet. Um, I think I'll wait maybe one more minute uh, and just um, say thank you all for joining us, those of you who will be joining us, and thanks to the South Carolina Arts Commission. Um, the McKissick Museum has a partnership with the South Carolina Arts Commission, a folk life partnership, and um, they award the museum an annual grant that allows us uh, to do programs like this. And if you haven't already tuned in to our Friday night uh, Quarantunes series, um, that's a program that we invented very quickly uh, when it became very difficult to host in-person uh, programs, concerts uh, with Folk Heritage Award winners. Um, our uh, Folk Life Program Coordinator, Ian Halligan, came up with the idea of having a Quarantunes music series on Friday night so that we could still um, shine a light on the uh, traditional musicians who have been recipients of the Jean Laney Harris Folk Heritage Award, which is the highest award that our state gives to practitioners and advocates for the traditional arts. And um, so, yeah, uh, we've been very, very proud to be able to present um, those uh, musicians uh, thanks to the South Carolina Arts Commission Folk Life Partnership Grant. So your state dollars at work. Um, thank you very much. So again, I can't tell whether anybody has joined us yet. Um, I don't see any comments like I did before when I was doing this program, but I guess I will just go ahead and proceed as if you all are with us. Um, so again, I'd like to welcome you all to our uh, online Facebook Live, Facebook um, Quilt Documentation Day, uh, a virtual version of what we were doing in person at the University of South Carolina's McKissick Museum to be able to continue a quilt history project that uh, folklorist Laurel Horton began in uh, the 1980s. And, um, and that was very important to documenting our state's uh, quilt traditions. And this continues that research so that we can build the data that is in our uh, South Carolina Folklife Resource Center um, and available to the public for in perpetuity. So um, again, uh, the image that you see right now um, is actually a larger image of a detail that I showed last, uh, last month. Um, it is a quilt by Athelai Brown that was shared by Drus Drusilla Brookshire. And we saw just a little, uh, like I said, a little portion of it. And, uh, and it's funny because Lisa Lamper wrote a, a note in the comments saying, you know, she'd really like to see the whole thing. And, uh, and I thought, well, well, yeah, we'll just start off by showing the whole quilt. Um, this is it. It's a very unusual set simply because the color choice that Ethel I made with the cranberry color um, in the background is very unusual. You, you, you just don't see that kind of darkish color choice. Um, so, and, and it turns out that Lisa was interested in this perhaps and curious because she inherited from her father's family through her, her dad, um, a uh, double wedding ring quilt as well. So uh, the next image will be of uh, Lisa Lamper's quilt that she has from her father's family. So there it is. Um, and you can see it's a very, very different graphic sensibility. Um, if we can show a little bit more of it, well, again, the, what you see is that the white or off-white background uh, creates a very different overall visual impact. Um, what's, what's not immediately visible um, and will be more visible in more of a detail is that it uses more pastel colors with little spots of, of navy um, 
uh, dating it to uh, probably the late 30s, mid to late 30s. So here's a, a detail. So you can see that, um, that it's a lot of lavenders um, with uh, a lot of other kinds of pastel uh, fabrics. Again, very great way of using up scraps um, for, for people who sewed. Um, this was a pattern that didn't become widely available um, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, through you know printed means until uh, the the twenties thirties. Um, so you don't see it until then widely being used. Um, although it's a pattern that you know you can see in weaving um, uh, patterns that are much older. So it's not a, a new pattern by any means, but it it acquired the sort of um, the double wedding ring or a double wedding band identity uh, when it started to be published in the 1930s in particular. Um, and one of the ways that this became so popular, I believe, is that Mountain Mist Batting um, Company, uh, you know, they would sell uh, different kinds of batting to put in between, it's the, the, the stuffing that goes uh, between the two layers of the quilt is called batting, for those of you who may not know that. Um, and, uh, and Mountain Mist was one of the primary producers of it. And oftentimes on their packaging, they would include a pattern, uh, a quilt pattern. And this is one of the patterns that was printed on a Mountain Mist batting fabric wrapper. And so it became, again, a very popular pattern that many people used. Now in Lisa's family, um, we believe that this was made by Della Van Deest of Prairie View, Kansas. And Della lived from 1891 to 1953. And she got married in 1913. Oh, there, um, yeah, hey, hey, Drusilla, how you doing? Drusilla's with us. Um, uh, so, so she married in 1913 and this pattern, uh, and particularly in these colors in the pastels that are very much depression era kinds of, of colors, color schemes, um, would not have been, uh, it's not likely that this was made for her wedding. Um, and uh, Lisa is thinking that maybe she made it on the 25th wedding anniversary of her and her husband. But I think, um, you know, we, we can't know for sure because we can't have a conversation with Della. But, um, but I think um, it, it's not unreasonable to think that she, like uh, Athelai Brown, just found a pattern that she was intrigued by. It's a little difficult, but it uses scraps and it, it's a challenge design wise to be able to take a lot of scraps and make it a visual whole. And you can see how um, how Della, you know, again, took the dark fabrics that kind of pop out of the pastels here um, on this uh, double wedding ring quilt. Um, and, uh, and she may have just been, again, intrigued. Um, the fact that she came from Kansas also, um, Kansas was a very lively place for quilt making during the, the 30s and 40s because the Kansas City Star um, was one of the premier newspapers around the country that regularly printed quilt patterns in the newspaper. Um, and, and those newspaper quilt patterns, you know, became very much what women would trade around, mail to each other, share with each other. Um, so so it's, not, it's not outside the realm of possibility that, um, that Della just, you know, again, became aware of this pattern and uh, and thought it was an interesting challenge to use up some scraps and uh, and did this really lovely version of um, of the double wedding ring quilt. A little bit more about Della. Um, she was married to a gentleman who um, had a store. Um, uh, it was a, a, a I don't want to say dry goods, so it was a wholesale store is what um, Lisa um, called it. So uh, she, you know, they, they were apparently a very prominent you know, family in the community because they own this wholesale uh, company. Um, and so uh, can we go to the next image of this particular quilt? Because you can see the really nice uh, quilting. So um, so when, when quilters chose to use a pattern like this um, that was very scrappy, used up scraps, but, you know, had a lot of uh, blank space, um, in it, it often was a way to showcase your quilting skills. And in this situation, uh, Della, you know, really went to town on the quilting. There's a, a lovely outline quilting of the, um, of the double wedding rings, but also in the middle, uh, there uh, is a lovely uh, floral pattern. Um, does the next slide show that perhaps? Can we see the next slide? No. Okay. Well, sorry about that. Um, it did not show that, but, uh, but 
the other thing, again, um, that shows the kind of needle womanship that this particular quilt demonstrates is the fact that the border um, it was not, you know, wrapped from the back to the front or the front to the back, but there's actually a separate border that you can see that was attached separately to this quilt, meaning, again, more time, more resources, a little bit more investment in making this particular quilt, which obviously has been valued um, and will continue to be valued by Lisa and her family um, moving forwards. So, uh, so Lisa, thank you for sharing this with us. Um, the next image is of a, a quilt in the family collection of Nancy Watkins. So Nancy is a good friend of Drusilla Brookshire. They both grew up in Calhoun, Georgia. So, um, so after um, Drusilla was so good to share with us her, her uh, grandmother's family quilts, um, Nancy uh, shared with us um, her family quilts. And um, this particular quilt I started, I wanted to show you first from her family collection because you can see how big it is. Okay, so, um, so we, what we know from Nancy about these quilts are that they came from her family um, uh, that was living during the 19th century in and around Lebanon, um, Kentucky. So this is a very large quilt. Um, you can see again how far it comes down on the side of this particular bed. And that's one real clue to its age because um, most quilts that were you know, nine feet by nine feet or 10 feet by 10 feet, um, that's a good sign that the quilt was made before the Civil War, simply because for some reason the bed um, structures, sizes, they were high and often had a trundle bed underneath so that quilts would have been made large enough to cover the people who were on the top, but also for the trundle bed that would be pulled out um, from underneath the bed. So, so we can be pretty sure that this particular quilt is from the 19th century. Could I see the next image? Again, very scrappy. You cannot see very well. I, I wanted to include this because the amount of batting in this particular quilt is so thin. You can see the uh, 16 patches from the backing. So. It, it clearly was a summer, you know, must have been a summer quilt. This was not made primarily to keep you warm. You can see the blocks through the backing, uh, the plain backing, um, but the quilting is absolutely um, meticulous. So uh, whoever made this quilt, and we're not sure who made this particular quilt, um, had very fine needlework skills. Next slide, please. Um, you can see, again, the border here um, is separate. So again, you know, time, effort, even though it was a scrap quilt. And um, so it was made, you know, to be used up probably. Um, it was a scrappy quilt, very simple uh, six pat, 16 patch design um, unit. Um, the maker did take the time and trouble to put on a separate binding so that if the, if the edges wore out, they could easily replace it and not have to lose any of the size of the quilt. Next one, please. Next image. Okay, so another um, quilt that came to Nancy Watkins through her family from Kentucky. Um, this is a much smaller basket quilt. Again, looks like double pink fabrics used um, in the in-between squares. Very common basket pattern from the 19th century. Um, not sure if it would have been before um, uh, the Civil War or after because um, double pinks were popular, you know, for a long period of time. Again, another scrappy quilt. So this family, um, you know, had resources. Uh, they had the time and they had the fabric to make really, really beautiful quilts. Um, but they were very frugal insofar as they, you know, used up scraps uh, because, you know, in the 19th century, even though the Industrial Revolution, you know, happened pretty early in the United States, um, fabric was still pretty dear. Um, and certainly during uh, and after the Civil War, um, fabric uh, production had been disrupted significantly. So fabric was really, um, people, people kept their scrap bags for a long time um, and quilters in particular. So, um, so I want you to see the quilting on this, however. Could I see the next uh, image, Amanda? Okay, so you can see from the back of this quilt, um, the quilting is uh, not in any kind of grid pattern. It's done more in a clamshell pattern. And you can see how raised the, um, it's very sculptural um, uh, in terms of uh, how it looks from the back and also from the front. 
um, when you see a closer up image of it from the front, you see just how sculptural it is because there was a thick bat put in this one. So, um, so this one was made to keep somebody warm. Uh, the, the maker put enough batting in there so that when you quilted it, it really raised up like a, a sculptural relief of the, of the pattern. So um, again, next image, please. Okay, so, uh, so this is, uh, again, from the same family. Um, it's an Irish chain, uh, which again, was a very, very common pattern. Um, but it took a little bit more resources to, um, to create an Irish chain simply because you're using mostly two fabrics. So you had to be very intentful and go out and buy enough of the darker fabric here to be able to make um, a quilt that had this kind of visual graphic impact of the same you know, fabric um, throughout um, the, the piece. Um, again, it doesn't seem to be as large as the others, but, um, but nonetheless, again, very, very meticulous quilting. Um, next image, please. Yeah, this is the back of it, and it is it is quilted in a grid pattern, um, very tightly quilted. You know, many many stitches per inch. I would say at least twelve stitches per inch. Very tiny, regular uh, quilting stitches. And again, the, the Irish chain pattern was another one of those patterns where there was a lot of um, uh, white fabric or solid fabric, so that you could really show off your quilting skills um, uh, if if you had good quilting skills. And in the nineteenth century. Um, again, I think I may have said this on one of the other episodes, you know, having really good sewing skills was a great advertisement for you as a prospective bride, um, because before the sewing machine was widely available, um, being able to have, um, you know, have good sewing skills meant that you could sew clothes for your families, you could, you could hem all the sheets, you could, it, it was a very um, valued skill and valuable skill uh, to have um, within a family. Um, and some people were better at it than others. And, and those women who were very good at it, um, you know, uh, were, were not shy about advertising that they had that skill set because it was a great asset to a family to be able to have someone who had good sewing skills. While there certainly were um, families who would invite a seamstress to come to their homes, uh, more affluent families, especially in the South, would perhaps have um, a, a seamstress who came and stayed in their family uh, for several weeks at a time, maybe even a month. Um, in order to make the families close. Uh, most families didn't have that, that advantage. And so the women who had good sewing skills were, were, were very much, again, needed in demand. Um, and, uh, and, and showing off those skills in a quilt was one way um, that, uh, that in young women especially would advertise their eligibility for marriage and, and skill set required for that. So um, the next image, please. Again, this is the uh, edge of uh, the um, the quilt, and you can see that uh, it's it's a separate um, it's a separate binding. So again, the, the, this whole set of quilts from Nancy Watkins' family um, were made with very fine needlework skills. I mean, they they've they've been loved, and so uh, not in the best of condition in many cases. But um, but one of the reasons they did survive, even in not such great condition, is that the quilting is so tight. Um, that it held the fabrics together, even when they, you can see in this patch in the right hand corner, um, some of the, the, the fabrics have, have worn, you know, you can see the batting through them. So, uh, but, but they have a great stability because of the quality of the quilting and the kinds of binding that were put on them. Next piece, please. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the piece that when I saw, I was like, oh my gosh. Um, and, uh, and indeed, uh, in, in Nancy Watkins family. Uh, this is the piece that we think we know the most about. Um, and you can see again, it is very, very large. It is square and it was likely made prior to the Civil War. Um, it was made, we think, and, and the reason we think this is that um, uh, there's a name written in ink. Uh, the name is John Young um, and it's written on a corner. Um, Actually, Amanda, could you go forward a little bit and then come back, show the, the piece with the, um, the writing? Okay, so John Young. Okay, so that's what appears in ink. Um, up until I think it was 1834, uh, quilt makers did not use ink on their quilts, primarily because the, the, the inks were corrosive. But in 1834, Payson 
uh, company came out with an indelible ink. So after 1834, it was not uncommon for quilters to put, um, you know, to, to put names or to put something on the quilt using indelible ink. And this says John Young. Okay, so what does that mean? And who was John Young? Well, it's kind of intriguing because there are two John Youngs in, um, in Nancy's family. Um, there was a John Young Sr. and a John Young Jr. And the fact that the name is written on here, um, you know, it's, it's uh, it, it, what, what does that mean? Um, was it made for him? Was it owned by him at some point? Because um, again, prior to the Civil War um, and not too long after the Industrial Revolution, um, people put their names on things because they owned them. It was a mark of ownership um, to put a name on a textile and textiles um, were valuable items. They were in probate inventories. I mean, people passed these things along uh, in their families because textiles were so dear. Um, they were difficult to produce and, um, and, and again, very expensive uh, prior to the Civil War. And um, so, uh, so the name John Young, uh, again, is a point of, uh, of, of departure for thinking about, well, what, what was this quilt made for? Um, you know, what does it mean? What purpose did it serve in the family? So, uh, so John Young Sr. Um, was born in 1797 and passed away in 1881. Um, and his wife was Sally Wycliffe Gibbs Young. And we think that she perhaps made this for John Young Jr. because John Young Jr.'s birth and death dates are 1837 to 1921. And if you could go back, Amanda, to the full quilt um, image. Thank you. Okay, so this particular pattern um, has a very long history. Um, it's a variation of a mariner's compass pattern that you know was popular in England in the 18th century and early 19th century here in the United States. But what's really, really intriguing about this particular interpretation of that is that um, it has 13 points. Um, all of the mariner's compass patterns that I could find that were published in the 19th century had many, many, many more. Okay, so 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 13 points interior to the square block and then 13 points exterior to the, to the square block. Well, what I learned from talking with Nancy um, about her, her great, great um, Sally Wycliffe Gibbs Young is that um, Sally, uh, her grandfather had fought um, in the Revolutionary War. And as part of his pension for, for serving in the war, he was awarded land in Kentucky, which is how the family ended up in Kentucky. And, uh, and she was a very um, active member, we think, of the DAR. Or she, um, we need to do some more research, I guess, to, to confirm that. But it seems that she had DAR uh, makings, certainly. Um, and, uh, and the fact that she chose to make this particular pattern with the 13 um, uh, uh, little pieces, you know, uh, 13 surrounded by 13, that 13 were the number of the original colonies in the United States. And it, it may be coincidental. Again, we can't say for sure, um, but the timing of when this quilt likely would have been made um, may have, have coincided with uh, John Young Jr. Uh, coming of age at 18. Um, and that would have been, what, 18, Let's see, 1855 ish, uh, when he would have gotten the right to vote. And there is a tradition uh, within the quilt making community in North America of making what were called freedom quilts. So it is perhaps uh, possible that this particular quilt um, was made by Sally for her son, John, um, as a freedom quilt on the occasion of his 18th birthday. Um, it is incredibly, uh, uh, you know, when I when I first saw it, I thought it was applique, but actually it's pieced. Um, could, Amanda, could you move forward a little bit? Okay. Um, yeah, let's stop here because again, the back of this um, was really, really fascinating. Um, it's it's hard to read what these words are. So the back had, 
The backing fabric is solid except for these stamped words, which uh, Nancy and I have, have sort of together figured out that the words, these are not the only words on the backing um, that were stamped um, and appear in sort of mirror image in reverse. Uh, but she has figured out that the words are superior finish, warranted quality shirting. So again, so for families who, who ordered, ordered fabric, you know, from which to make their family's clothing, um, would have had pieces of fabric that had the, um, the logo and the, uh, the guarantee from the manufacturer on it. And they would use these quilts even on the back of very, very special quilts. Right. They would use something like that, that that preserved, um, you know, for us, uh, they would often try to bleach these things out and get them lighter. But but in this case, um, we can still see uh, parts of these words that were on sh shirting fabric. And you can see here the quilting, how tiny it is. So this was quilted um, uh, on on a, on a diagonal throughout the whole whole piece. Um, and could you go now to the detail of the square, please, Amanda? That, yeah. Okay, so you can see here, at first I thought this was applique, and in fact it's not, it's pieced. And even the um, the red and green sashing in the, in the around the, the central um, uh, sort of star-like shape or sunburst shape um, is pieced, not, not applique, which would have been really difficult. Um, and so this, this particular quilt in, in, um, in Nancy's family was probably the P.S. de Resistance. Again, it's a three color quilt. Um, so somebody had to go out and really be intentful about getting the green, the red and the indigo, which has maintained its vibrancy and, as a blue fabric there um, and, uh, and, and, and created this um, very ambitious um, and beautiful uh, quilt. Now, what was really um, interesting when I looked uh, up the uh, I used Barbara Brackman's Encyclopedia of Pieced Patterns. And when I saw or found uh, the closest thing I could find to this particular pattern um, was, uh, let me see what it was, what publication it came out of. Um, oh, The Country Gentleman in 1853 published a variety, a version of this particular pattern, and it named it the Valley Forge or George Washington quilt. So again, um, whether uh, Sally, uh, you know, read The Country Gentleman or had access to a subscription to it, um, or whether a friend of hers did and she was able to get this pattern uh, from her friend, um, it was in circulation as of 1853, printed version, published version as Valley Forge, George Washington quilt which again um, reinforces the idea that um, this may have been created, the 13 pointed um, sort of sunburst surrounded by the 13 points, um, very much to celebrate uh, her grandfather's service in the Revolutionary War and her family's long time history as part of winning, uh, creating and founding the United States of America. And, um, and, and again, kind of ties nicely to the theory, and again, it's just a theory that this might have been made by Sally for her son um, as a freedom quilt, because it, this was when, you know, the United States won its freedom from Britain, it commemorates that, um, and it may, she may have made it to commemorate his um, being able, coming of age and being able to vote. Um, let's see here. Comments. Oh, Judy, Judy Twitty is joining us. Um, Judy, I just, uh, this morning, um, I, uh, you know, Judy is the 2020, one of the 2020 uh, recipients of the Jean Laney Harris Folk Heritage Award. And congratulations, Judy, because it's much deserved. And uh, this morning, David Platts and I uh, did a taping at the governor's mansion um, because we, unfortunately, because of COVID, we're not gonna be able to have an in-person ceremony, but, um, but the Arts Commission has taken the lead on creating a, uh, a pre-recorded um, ceremony um, that will feature Judy and uh, the other 2020 Jean Laney Harris Award Folk Heritage Award recipients. So, um, so welcome. Oh, Rob Hunter is there too. Okay, um, great. Um, so, so does anybody have any any questions about what I've been talking about this morning? Again, 
Um, we've talked a little bit about the wedding ring quilt pattern, um, about when it came into uh, popularity because of uh, the ways in which things like batting, um, fab, uh, you know, batting wrappers circulated within communities um, to share patterns for, among women who were sharing patterns. Also because of the Kansas City Star in Kansas where uh, Lisa's um, uh, quilt comes from uh, was a very, very uh, um, active source of uh, patterns for uh, women in Kansas and beyond. Um, and, uh, and then uh, with, with Nancy's quilts, I mean, what you have, again, we, we really don't know exactly who made any of them. Although again, this one in particular that has the name John Young on it, I think we can pretty safely associate with, um, uh, with Sally, who was the wife of the uh, older John Young, who uh, was the mother of the younger John Young that has the name written in the, um, on the quilt itself. Um, let's see here. Oh, Sharon and David, oh my gosh. Um, so at any rate, um, this, uh, this, these are all the quilts that we had to share for today. Um, and last uh, episode, we were talking about, um, you know, sort of the performance-based traditions that, you know, were associated with quilt making. And, um, and I thought, well, since we did start with, and Amanda, can you go back to the, um, the, the first wedding ring quilt? Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know if, um, you know, uh, whether Drusilla was on, uh, on the, on the chat, uh, when we, when we showed this to start out with, but, um, but, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of, um, traditional music, um, written from the point of view of women about weddings and marriage. And, um, and I just thought I might share with you a little bit, um, about, about those uh, because they range very widely. Um, there's one uh, song uh, that starts out, um, Farewell Mother. And the entire song is about um, the, the two of them and the family, um, the, the bride's family crying because, um, because getting married in some families meant moving far away from your family. Um, and especially if, uh, if it was a family you know, that was moving westward during the pioneer period, um, you might not see your family again. And, um, and of course, you know, getting married always comes with um, risk. And in the context of the song, um, she talks about how her, her heart is sort of filled with hope um, and, and, and kind of despair because, you know, she's trusting someone who may deceive her, um, her husband. So she's just, you know, a little, a little um, torn there about leaving her family and um, whereas now, you know, again, now we fly all over the place, you know, we get married, we don't necessarily, you know, uh, ever expect not to see our, our families again, but in the 19th century and 18th century too, I'm sure, um, marriage sometimes meant, you know, really separating physically, being separate physically. And of course the phones didn't exist. There was not, you know, couldn't text, could, you know, there wasn't even the telegraph in some cases. So, um, so, so there was that one song that was just very, very sad and moving about um, getting married, meaning saying goodbye to your mom and your, your family. Um, so it ranges from things like that to, of course, very celebratory um, uh, songs celebrating, you know, the dancing at Mari's wedding, you know, uh, to um, kind of tongue in cheek songs. Um, there's, there's one called um, uh, Old Maid in the Attic. And uh, it's, it's sung from the point of view of a woman who you know, is now in her, you know, 30s, 40s, and uh, her younger sister has been married for a while and has kids already, and she's like never been proposed to. So she's singing in the song about all the things that she would love to do and offer a husband to be, but the entire song um, closes with, uh, she, she sings that if she can't have a man, well, she'll get a sexy parrot, you know, um, that, that she'll have to settle somehow. But but meanwhile, she's advertised her skills in cooking, cleaning, and all the things that any prospective husband would want. Um, but it's told with, in a very kind of again like tongue-in-cheek way. Um, so, so, so yeah. And I, I guess one of um, uh, again the, the more uh, uh, I don't want to say uh, 
negative because it's not really negative, but but there's one that starts out, sorry the day I was married and sorry the day I was wed. So, you know, it starts out talking about how, you know, she just got married too young, you know, and that she advises, you know, the, the women around the quilting frame, perhaps, um, that, uh, that, you know, getting married really young is not such a great idea, perhaps. So, um, so yeah, so, so there's this wonderful tradition of songs uh, where women sort of give each other advice about courting, you know, who to court, what to watch out for, you know, what happens, you know, before you get married, if you marry an older man, because again, um, in earlier historical periods, it was not unusual. And I guess it's not unusual now for, for younger women to marry older men. And um, so there's quite a bit of advice about uh, those kinds of marriages. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, uh, so it's, it's, it's my theory that, again, all of these songs may have been those kinds of songs that would have been sung by women for each other at quilting parties, gatherings, um, to, uh, to, again, transfer knowledge, you know, to have fun, um, to just um, articulate points of view that maybe weren't so popular in the greater, you know, in, the, in larger conversations, uh, perhaps, but, um, but yeah, but nonetheless important to share. So, um, Looking here, seeing if there's any other questions. So I think Lisa is going to have some more quilts to share with us for next episode. But I would invite you, if you or someone you know has quilts that they would like to have documented. Um, I have to say, uh, Drusilla um, and uh, and Nancy, who are friends, you know, from Calhoun, Georgia, they have done the mother load of subsequent research on the one quilt that was a sort of, um, it was a balloon girl uh, quilt um, that had names on it. And they have uh, done an incredible job of tracking down who these people really were and what their relationships were. And we thought uh, because it was associated with a, um, a group that initially um, was associated with a church, but apparently it was a social group that you know, maybe had some affiliation with the church, but not exclusively. Um, and they've been intrigued by the kinds of um, relationships they've turned up uh, and are still turning up. Um, so uh, thank, thanks to them for being the super sleuths who uh, were inspired by, I hope this this quilt documentation kind of program to, to delve a little bit deeper into what these particular, um, I will call them art objects, meant for the women who made them and uh, preserved them um in terms of the communities of care and uh and caring um that uh existed and supported them uh during earlier times so thank you all for um being with me today um i'll i know there's a, a little time lag in when you can hear me and i can see any questions you might have so um so I will wait just to, I'll pause just a minute and I'll look at my notes because there's maybe something that I, I created a note for and did not mention. I guess, let's see here. Oh yeah, so Lisa, um, you know, uh, has asked me if I could please share what I told her about quilts as fundraisers at churches. Um, and, uh, yeah, she and I were talking about how women always find ways to, um, you know, to, to have a public voice, to have their say, to make their views known. And uh, when I was a, a, a lowly graduate student at the New York University, um, I had a summer research position working with folklorist Joyce Ice at the Delhi Historical Society because they had gotten a small grant uh, to study quilt making groups in the upstate area there around Delhi, um, New York. So Joyce and I, we attended um, many quilting bees or gatherings, you know, over the course of the summer. And, um, and this would have been like the early 90s. Um, and what was really fascinating to me, one of the things that we learned was that some of the groups and one in particular, um, that was within a church, it was, um, the quilting group that was within the church 
um, turns out that that it they, they they raise money so they they quilted for people for money um, so their quilting group within the church was a fundraiser but the funds they raised they decided what happened um, so so in 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 churches where um, women didn't necessarily have control over the purse strings or made decisions about how the church spent its monies. Um, there were quilting groups within churches that raised money specifically to be able to support the, the missions that they wanted to support, whether that was overseas missionaries, whether it was a local um, uh, orphanage. I mean, they, they, they did this to be able to exert some you know, an acceptable, it was an acceptable way for them to exert some um, influence with regards to how their church's resources were, were expensed in the community. So it was a way that they could express their values um, and, uh, and, and really have control over, yeah, how their own, uh, the resources that they helped the church create were, were utilized. Um, What's the best way to store and maintain these quilts? Okay, so um, so we'll we have a flyer that you can access. Um, I think it's on Facebook, um, and if not, we'll put it on Facebook. A link to it. Um, you know, so much depends on what your resources are um, and uh, where you live. Um, in the southeastern United States, you know, the big um, the big issue for quilts is usually um, humidity heat and humidity, uh, but light. Light and humidity are the two enemies. So um, in terms of how in your home, you know, is a safe way to store quilts, um, you can use cotton pillowcases. I mean, that is a very acceptable way of storing a quilt. Um, you need to refold your quilt in the pillowcase, you know, pretty regularly, you know, every three to six months, ideally, so that it doesn't crease or fold um uh the, the or where it's folded doesn't create weaken the fabric and create um ultimately you know places where the fabric starts to to break down um so that's sort of like the minimal that you can do i think that's within most people's means and you know an old uh cotton sheet that breathes you know um is is perfectly acceptable um and storing it in you know uh, a place that again um the the pillowcase will preserve it from from, from the light, but you want to make sure that it's in a dry place. Um, you don't want uh, to put it in a very high humidity area. Um, I wouldn't put it, you know, in a bathroom cupboard, a uh, place where it's going to get a lot of humidity. Um, the the uh, the museum quality of way ways of uh, of storing quilts um, are to purchase. You can there are any number of companies if you Google um, uh, acid free tissue and boxes um, that you can order online uh, that help preserve your quilt. And the tissue is to put in the fold. So if you're using a box, you know, and you have to fold the quilt to get it into a box, um, you roll tissue in order to cushion those places where the folds are so that again, those folds, places where it's folded, the fibers don't become weak. Um, and uh, again, you still would have to change out, uh, you know, refold them uh, periodically, even with the tissue in the in the creases, because because the tissue flattens over time as well. Um, but acid-free tissue and boxes um, that are archival quality, you know, are sort of you know one of the more optimal ways that that you can store your your quilts at home. Um, truly, the 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 ideal way you would store a quilt. Um, uh, is, well, you know, people, uh, if you have a, a bedroom where you have a bed that's not being used at all, and it's, you know, you can close the shades and blinds, just storing it flat on a bed is not a bad way, um, and put a sheet over it to keep the dust off of it, that kind of thing. So that's uh, another way that if you have, again, that kind of space and um, availability at your house, you can safely store quilts in that way. But, um, but rolling them, and what we do at McKissick Museum, um, we had um, one of our, our former um, collections managers, her husband built us some very specialized quilt racks um, so that we could roll our quilts. Because again, if you roll quilts, then you don't have to fold them. So you don't risk creating the weaknesses along with places where the seam, the creases are, where the folds are. 
um, and you want to roll roll quilts on a a, 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 a substance that is either covered already in muslin, um, but that's that's um, not going to have like you wouldn't put it around a cardboard, you know, a piece of cardboard because cardboard um, uh, things would migrate from the cardboard into the fabric. So if you wanted to use a big cardboard roll, um, if you had one, if you wrapped it with saran wrap and to prevent anything from migrating out of that cardboard and then wrap that with a cotton sheet um, or muslin and then rolled your quilt around that, that would be a safe way to store your quilt. Um, and you would store it again. Uh, sometimes people have big closets closets big enough, the bottom of the closet or the top of the closet, if you have a big closet, or sometimes even under your bed, you know, if you've got it, if you've got a roll that, you know, it, and if it's a big quilt, then it's, you're going to need as much space as would be under a bed in order to put a rolled quilt um, safely somewhere. Um, and then of course you would not, you know, put it rolled without putting a covering layer of muslin, cotton sheet, fabric around it to prevent it from you know, getting dusty, dirty under a bed or even in the bottom of a closet. Um, so uh, let's see here. So yeah, so again, um, conservatives have very different approaches um, to, uh, to how you store quilts and how you protect them over time. Uh, but I think the consensus is less is more. I mean, or less is better, um, that the, the more intervention you do, the more, um, problem there is, but you should really consult with a professional textile conservator um, before making a decision about what to do. If it's especially an older quilt that that um, perhaps maybe is soiled or, you know, um, has had water damage, um, a conservator can is, you know, is the best person to consult with about how best whether whether washing it is to the quilt's advantage or not, because in many cases, um, you know, people will throw an old quilt in a washing machine and it just can't, it can't handle that. Um, and there are ways of safely, you know, water washing a quilt, um, but you want to make sure that you know how to do that right. And so that you don't again, damage what you've got there. Um, so we have handouts for those uh, questions and for, that have references to the, um, to the materials or to the websites where you can order the acid-free tissue um, and boxes uh, to store your quilts. Um, safely at home. But again, the, 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 for those of you who don't want to go to that extent, um, the pillowcase method, you know, is kind of tried and true. Um, you don't want to stack too many on top because again, anytime you stack quilts that are folded on top of each other, it, it, it reinforces the creasing and weakens those areas that have been folded. So you want to try to avoid that as much as possible. But, but, um, but the cotton pillowcase, you know, lets the, uh, the quilt breathe and will protect it from dust and dirt and um yeah and it's most is most importantly really readily available and affordable for most people to be able to access okay so i think that's all the questions that have come in today um i'm thrilled drusilla that you joined us again thank you pam um uh, I mean, Lisa, uh, for sharing the wedding ring quilt. And I look forward to the other quilts you wanted to, to share with us. And um, and Nancy, again, you know, your family's quilts are very special. And especially that one um, that's the Valley Forge or um, George Washington quilt. I mean, that's just incredible to have as part of your family history. Um, and it's just so much fun to think about what it's possible purpose and meanings were within the context of that family. And it's just tremendous that you, um, all of you are, are making an effort to know more about what you have and sharing it with the public um, through the Folk Life Resource Center, because this data will all be, you know, um, uh, uh, it, it'll be collated and stored in uh, the Folk Life Resource Center. And once COVID passes, and maybe even before that, I can send you a label, you know, to stitch on the corner of your quilts so that, um, so that the next person or generation that inherits them, um, if they forget to, to ask you about it, um, they can call us because of the little tag on the quilt, which is what happens a lot now from those quilts from the 80s that 
um, McKissick Museum documented, we get a lot of phone calls from people who've inherited those quilts and they go, you know, I forgot to ask aunt so-and-so, you know, where, where she got this or who made this and, and we're able to share with those folks um, the information that families shared with us at the time of the documentation, as well as the information that um, the quilt historians who've been involved with the project always um, have been able to kind of add to the story uh, with regards to the kinds of fabrics, the age, you know, the techniques used, that kind of thing. So, um, so thank you all. And I look forward to July and to seeing what comes into my email box between now and then. In the meantime, take care, um, be safe. Thanks again to the South Carolina Arts Commission for the Folk Life Partnership Grant that helps make programs like this and our Quarantunes music series possible. And, um, and stay tuned. Okay, take care, bye-bye.